in regards to uh, a little bit of the message or regards to a thank you, really. And that is that uh, last, let's see here, what was it? Week, week before last, week before last, that um, uh, sounded like a pulley was going out in our, our van. And just part of uh, things that go out after a while, a bearing of some sort started to go bad and, and started to make a knock and knew that had to be addressed. And uh, so I was going to find a mechanic uh, Monday, uh, a week and a half, week and a half ago. I was going to say I'm, I need to go find a good mechanic to work on this, and and started it Sunday to go to the nursing home, and and it, something went. I was like, whoa, try to shut it back off. It was running, but it, the knocking got real bad real quick. And I said, man, if something's up, and uh, found out it's set timing on it, and uh, which is always a bad thing. You can't, don't want to drive it. And I didn't want to drive it very far, so I uh, took it with bumper to bumper, and uh, they, the mechanic there, we talked about it. We were pretty certain what it was, uh, and uh, looked over it, and it looked exactly like that, and he said he can get it fixed. And so, praising God, he can get it fixed, and had to drive it anywhere, didn't have to tear up the motor, good, good motor, good vehicle. And... Um, the Lord's blessed us with it, and and uh, and just proud to have it. And so uh, he started to work on it, and and I, I told him just let me know what it's going to cost when it's all said and done. I had to order some special uh, parts, Honda. You know, some of these cars that you got to get just the right ones for them. <laughs> but anyway, they uh, so he got it all. It was it was there was an interior pulley that had gone uh, out, tension rod had uh, gone out. And so it did jump timing, and but man, it's running like a top. Went over there to pay them, and it was all paid. It was all paid, and uh, I just want to say thank you uh, because I, I'm here at a loving, loving church uh, that uh, really takes care of us. And I don't know who paid for it. it wouldn't tell me. Wouldn't give me any clues. I tried to trick Al, and uh, he's pretty sharp. He's pretty sharp, and uh, and. Uh, <laughs> and I, you know, I've been in that uh, auto parts uh, uh, store often, where it looks like all of Beth is just about in there, and uh, you know, we, we frequent it. You know, we all do. And and uh, but I want to say thank you again so much. You made it a Christmas, and uh, and so many so many people here to thank for so many different things. And I just praise God for you, and I, I do pray for you, and I do lift you up in prayers, and. Uh, just faces that I see even today. I said, man, you, just, you have made my day. You have made my day. And I thank you so much for being here. And I praise God. Secondly, I want to say thank you for allowing me to go to the uh, Pastors Appreciation Conference that I go to every year uh, in Texas with both Jim Moss. He, he gets all the preachers that he preaches. Many of them can make it, and he allows them to preach. And uh, basically a two-day window. We have a ba basically a two-day-ish window. And uh, so we listened to 33 sermons this year. And... Uh, day and three quarters maybe and uh, you know that's over a half a year sermons that's over a half a year sermons for the, the, the normal church attender and I really I guess for the normal church attender that may be a year and a half worth of sermons <laughs> but anyway uh, we had a big time a great time I always look forward to going there I, I don't I didn't preach I go there I'm not even preaching you know uh, we have Jim about every other year and I didn't even, and it wasn't my year to preach, but I love going and fellowshipping and hearing what God is doing in some of these churches and some of these pastors. And it was a year of brokenness this year. Was, there was, always seems to be kind of a theme, and God was doing some things in, in different pastors' lives. Um, and it was a blessing, and it was an encouragement to be there. And I, I'm, I wanted to come home, I wanted to preach fire, I wanted to preach hard, I wanted to preach heavy. And boy, Lord knows I want to do that, but that's not what He gave me to do today. And this is going to be a little bit of a lesson, and I really wasn't wanting to go here. I've got two very special sermons I'm looking forward to next two Sundays, uh, really dealing with Christmas and the New Year, and, and maybe even a little bit of fun in that. Uh, but but today I wanted to talk about something else that came up. See, when we go there, uh, we I'm with uh, brothers, pastors from ABA churches, independent Baptist churches, uh, BMA churches, Southern Baptist churches. Uh, you know, Jim goes preach wherever whoever invites him, basically, and uh, and he stays busy, stays booked up for almost two years uh, solid in a row. But um, I was talking to one of my good, uh, uh, very conservative Southern Baptist preachers. Uh, over my solo, and uh, we, the, a lot of Arkansas preachers, we pull. We pull as we go there. We kind of catch up and pull. There's preachers from Oklahoma, preachers from Washington, uh, you know, just come in from all over. But anyway, 
uh, we were talking about some things that were going on, and uh, in, in, even within the group that were there, you know, we're hearing 33 sermons, and man, some are just phenomenal. Some of these men are phenomenal preachers. And uh, then and do, you say, do you agree with everything that's preached? No, I don't agree with everything that's preached. No, we've got a room full of over 100 preachers. You're, you're going to have some different opinions on things. That's, right. uh, that's just part of it. And, and you eat the meat and you spit the bones out. That's what you have to be able to do. But something I've noticed is there's, there's, a, there's a handful of preachers in the, some of the Southern Baptist work now that are... Uh, coming with some very uh, Pentecostal leanings, very Pentecostal leanings, and uh, they're they're really pushing some things. And I was talking to one of my Southern Baptist preacher friends, and and he said, John, I, you you don't you haven't been listening to some of this? I said, Well, tell me about it, and I'll start researching some more. And so um, uh, here, here's one article that I, I went through this week that we talked about in the in the Southern Baptist Convention. Many are calling for the election of Beth Morris to be the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. And there's a big push for her to be the, the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. And I, I'm just shocked. Shocked, but as I dig down into this, it becomes very clear what's going on here. Because within this, and the windows talking about it, there again uh, starts to come out these Pentecostal leanings, very, very prominent in their writings. Uh, they're called continuationists. And, and these continuationists believe that the gifts never went away. They've, per they've continued from the day of Pentecost all the way to the day. And, and not just partial gifts, but all gifts, even sign gifts. And they they've continued on. So that that's where their foundation is in this discussion that I'm having with you right now. Uh, so the push is for... Beth Moore to become president of Southern Baptist Convention. There was also the president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Ken Hemphill, uh, who was encouraging and pushing women pastors. Which is the a normal thing in a lot of Pentecostal churches, but now it's becoming something that's pushed in Southern Baptist. And guess what? Guess what? There's a push in the BMA too. You listen to me now. Listen to me. Everything that happens throughout... The Southern Baptist, and, and it filters here too. And so we're, we're going to just discuss some things because within this continuationist movement, uh, this idea uh, of the gifts is going, uh, it's also uh, centering prayer. Centering prayer, that's something that Beth Moore and many others are pushing. Uh, it is simply uh, Eastern mysticism rewrapped and rehashed and, and trying to come to the church. There's, there's so much going on. We don't have time to talk about all these facets and all these directions that are, they're, they're coming from. But let me tell you something. This is dangerous. It is dangerous. It's dangerous. What's coming down the pipe is very dangerous. And if you don't know anything about the meditative prayer, it's an emptiness. You're, you're emptying yourself and, and you're hoping that God fills in you. Uh, you and it, it's, it, it was... Not only is it Eastern mysticism, that was rewrapped into a New Age movement, which is now rewrapped into the Centering Prayer movement. It's all, uh, all packaged with different words, but the same stuff is coming down the pipe. Same stuff. You see, you and I are not to empty our minds. We're never called to do that. We're not called to empty ourselves of ourselves. We're called to fill ourselves with the knowledge and truth of God. Amen. The knowledge and truth of God. Uh, there is no uh, scripture direction where we, we become one with the universe and God and he, he magically fills us with all things. In fact, in fact, as we go through the message, we're going to see how the gift of even knowledge is God. You say, John, where do you stand on all this stuff? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I wasn't, again, I wasn't wanting to go here today, but we're going to go here because my answer to these questions and these thoughts come squarely from 1 Corinthians 13 and chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and chapter 14. And that's where we're going to go. And that's what we need to look at. Now, we don't have time to go through chapter 14, of course. We're going to be going through it as we already were. And, and Lord knows I didn't want to hit this passage today because I wanted to, to not just teach a bunch. I wanted to really... To really preach it. Because I'm fired up. You see, I mean, I was so excited. I was wanting to shout. And, and, well, we were shouting. We were shouting the whole 
couple days. It's a wonder I have a voice. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 8, because that's where we left off. And look at what it says. It says, charity never faileth. Now, I want you to hold on that. We're going to set it aside. But what it is doing is it's setting up something important. It's saying this doesn't fail. And by contrast, by contrast, this will fail. It's setting up a contrast for us today. This is very important for us to grab hold of. And so we're going to address charity as a whole right at the end of the message. But we need to go through here and we need to understand what Paul is saying at, at the, the clearest of terms. We need, to, we need to understand it. We need to grab it. Because if we do not, if we just skim over this and just read it flippantly, you may make, you make Bob say whatever you want. But let me tell you something. God inspired this to be understood and learned and thought about. And so we need to do that today. It's very important we do that today. Uh, now, I, I do want to be clear. When we go to this conference, understand that Texas, the Southern Baptist Convention in Texas has already been through a lot of this, what we're talking about. They're split. They've already split. There's a conservative group of Southern Baptist preachers and then there's a liberal so churches and there's a liberal group of Southern Baptist churches in Texas already. This happened back almost 10 years ago. And I know many of those conservative preachers and what the battle they fought. And guess what? We'll be fighting one too. Won't be long. So where do we stand? Where do I stand? Where would I believe the Word of God stands? Look at what it says. It says, Charity never faileth, but where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether it be prophecies, they shall fail. Now, prophecies literally means a discourse emanating from divine inspiration. God gave something, words from God, was given to be related to the people. And declaring the purposes of God, whether by reproving and admonishing the wicked or comforting the afflicted or revealing things hidden, especially foretelling future events. Friends, listen today. Prophecy, according to this definition, prophecy was finished on the Isle of Patmos by John. John the Revelator got the last revelation of God. If not, then we need to be added to the Bible. And let me tell you something, that is exactly what they're pushing. Added to the Bible, saying they've got the inspiration of God and they want to write into the Bible new books, new chapters, new verses that have never existed. They're not inspired. I'm not inspired. The Word of God is inspired. Amen. And it is profitable for doctrine, for proof and correction that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished. I don't, I don't need to give you anything but God's Word to thoroughly furnish you. That's right. And all good works. I don't have to come with a fresh, inspiration-filled Word from God. I need to just preach the Word. That's what Paul told Timothy. Preach the Word! Amen. That's what I'm going to do. Preach the Word. And they cover the first word, and I go, hmm, okay. Man, we even had a, a prophet Elijah there this year. Uh, uh, ask me about that later. It's a whole other story. It's a whole other story. Now, prophecy, he says, prophecies, they shall fail. What does he say? What does he mean by they shall fail? Fail comes from uh, kartagil. To render idle, to become inoperative, to be abolished, to do away with, to cause to cease. Remember this, katargil, they'll come up again. He goes on, he says, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Again, tongues are the languages that we speak today. We speak in our native tongue, in our native dialect. That is all it has ever meant and all it will ever mean. Not so dabble. Not so unintelligible thing. Now, Paul will address this very specifically in chapter 14. And chapter 14 is always so put out of context, it's disgusting. But we are going to go in. We're going to go verse by verse through chapter 14 and see exactly what he says about these things. But notice he says, tongues shall cease. Uh, Paul, to leave off, to desist, to come to an end. It runs its course, in other words. There was a course, there was a place for it. And he says, tongues will come to an end. In other words, it will run its course. There was a course for it to run. Now, notice he goes on. He says, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Knowledge is one that we understand. We hear the Gnostics, and they were big in hidden knowledge. Hidden knowledge, amen. That's what we're doing now. The apostles rejected. They said, this is wrong. This is not true. And here we are today with everyone with their own hidden knowledge. Hmm? But he's saying knowledge, not hidden knowledge, knowledge. That is uh, gnosis. 
Knowledge signifies general intelligence and understanding the general knowledge of Christian religion. In other words, the gift of knowledge was, it was bestowed upon you by the Holy Spirit. You understood the Christian uh, religion. Like that. You didn't have to study. What does Paul tell us now? Study. You better study. You better study. Yes, it was given. It was a gift. Now learn. You knew, you understood the Christian religion. You were saved and you understood what Christ was. You, know, you understood the, gift, the grace, the faith, the, the, all that God was... I'm telling you, it was a gift. Now notice this. He says, When it be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Guess what that word is? It's katargil again. It, uh, to cause to cease. To, do, to be done away with, to abolish. To become inoperative. To render idle. It shall cease. Verse 9, he goes on, he says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part. That is knowledge and prophecy again. Being brought up saying, why not tongues here? Because tongues was the mode to relay knowledge and prophecy. The language is a way to relay knowledge and prophecy. So he doesn't have to address that here. He needs to address the knowledge and the prophecy, those gifts, because he's already said, tongues shall come to its end. It run its course. Now he will bring it back in, and we need to bring it back in as we're going to look at this. But he says, we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Now, what is the we know in part, or prophesy in part? That's meros, uh, a portion, somewhat, a piece, or a portion, or a part of the whole. No, it's not the whole thing. We, we, don't, we don't know the whole thing, he says. We don't have all knowledge. We don't have all prophecy. We just have a part of it. A piece of the whole pie, if you will. We have a piece, a sliver of the pie. This is very important when understanding what he says in the next few verses. Notice he says, But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, Paul is putting it together here in verse 10. He's trying to put together this thought in 10, 11, and 12. He's going to wrap these thoughts up. He says it again. Say it again. But when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part, that piece of the whole, that portion of the whole, shall be done away with. Part. Again, moros, a portion, piece, a part of. That part means from out of, to come forth from, often used in the reference to giving birth. Okay? In other words, it's this word, meros, is part of, is used in phrases like David the king begat Solomon of Bathsheba. Solomon was a portion of David and Bathsheba. They, it came out from them. It was a part of them. And in the Jewish understanding, the forefathers are always greater than the next generation. And that makes sense, right? Because if you don't have parents, you will not exist. That's what they're saying. So notice what he goes on. He says, he says, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. That which is a piece out of the whole shall be done away. That's tilios. It's going to be brought to its end, finished in completeness. When that which is perfect is come. What is that? That which is perfect. That's that teleos. That when really it is completed. So when we look at this verse, look at it now. It says, but when that which is completed is brought to its finished conclusion is come, the peace that is a part of that shall be done with. Will be done with. Understand what he's saying here. He's saying that something is growing. Something is being built. Something is being put together. Something is being worked on. And when it is completed, when it is finished, when it has come to its conclusion, these things that are in part that we're dealing with, they're gone. It's done. This is telling us when these things are done now. So, again, but that, when that which is brought to its completed or finished state, that which is a portion or a piece of the whole shall be caused to cease. It's, what is he referring to? It's these gifts that he was referring to. The gift of knowledge, the gift of prophecy, hey, and the gift of tongues. We've never left that context. We've never left that context in all these verses. These portions will be done when something is finished. Now, the first thing that we need to realize is that this cannot be talking about 
Jesus Christ. Impossible. Impossible. Is Jesus... Does He need to be completed? No, He's always been complete. He's complete in every fashion, every fit. He is not a work in progress. And not only that, it said something, not someone. Amen? We're dealing with something, not someone. We're dealing with uh, something that is not gendered whatsoever. An, an item. An item. God is not an item. Jesus is not an item. Always referred to in the masculine. Always. And it's not come again. It's not come again. So something needs to be brought to its conclusion, its finished portion, and then all those pieces of the portion will be done with. Now what is it that fits this bill? What is it that is perfect and completed? When it has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Can I tell you, the only thing that fits that definition is the Word of God itself. Because it is the culmination of knowledge and the culmination of prophecy. It's the finished work. It's the finished work. It, the Word of God is the finished, the Bible that we hold our hand is the finished work, perfect in every way, completed in every way. It is finished, and all these things that were a portion of the finished work are done. That's what Paul's saying. Now notice, he's going to clarify it a little bit as he goes. This ought to be fairly clear, but in case it's not, he goes on and he talks about it in 10 and 11. Notice what he says. He says, um, well, we read 10, but we're going we're to do it. Did I skip 9? Somebody tell me, I skipped 9? No, I didn't skip. Okay. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away. The portion shall be done away when it is brought to its completion. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now what he referring to is childish things. There's only one thing he's referring to. It's the thing we've been referring to the whole time, these gifts. He said, this, this, is, this is childish stuff. The word is immature infants. Now that's very important because we're going to look at a lot of verses that use that same word, or we could, we're going to look at one passage anyway. But what is he saying? He's referring to these impart gifts. That's the context. So get this. Those that are saying from the church of Corinth, they're so proud. They're so proud of their tongues. They're so proud of their gift of knowledge. They're so proud of their gift of prophecy. Paul is saying that when all this is completed, all that you're dealing with here is just infant stuff. It's just what childish things. That's pretty powerful words. Ephesians 4, 14. Look at it. Ephesians 4, 13. Here's that passage that deals with this the same thing. Ephesians 4, verse 14, says this, that we henceforth be no more infants, children. We are to be infants or children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, the cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Listen, friend, if you are not in the Word, instead of the Word, you will be deceived. You know, I heard someone very close to me, in, my, in a family member close to me, and she said this. She said this. Uh, we, were, we were discussing the, the book of Job. We were discussing the book of Job. And she said, Job was a great, great sinner. And I said, well, that's really interesting you said that because God said he was not. He was not a great, great sinner. He was a great, great man of God. And, and she started to castigate Job. And I said, man, you sound just like his friends that God said if they don't repent, he's going to kill them. But it comes from this idea that, that, that it, by the way, prosperity gospel, that's what she, but prosperity gospel, now you know the, the context. This could not have happened to a guy who was close to God, because everyone close to God is extremely successful, and wealthy, and, and never has any problems. Woo. You talk about taking a whole book of the Bible, and basically booting it out the window, and just tarnishing the concept of dealing with difficulties in your life. Remember Satan comes and said, I'll show you that Job will curse your name. And God said, nah, you got the wrong man this time because Job, he is, a, he is a man of God. He will stay true to me no matter what happens. 
And so Satan went out to prove God wrong, but God is never proved wrong. Amen? Amen. You can't prove God wrong. And that's what's going on today. People are trying to prove God wrong. They're trying to take things that God never said and say, God, that is God's Word. And they'll tell you that's dangerous and destructive. Listen, he says, you got to be careful. He says, speak the truth in love. Verse 15 of Ephesians 4 says that uh, and we may grow up in Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now how do we do this? If you look back, if you look back, if you go back to, uh, we can go way back in this chapter, but let's just go to 10. It says, He that descended is the same that ascended far up above all heavens, that's Christ, that He might fill all things. And He, that's Christ, gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, for the edifying the body of Christ. Till we all come in unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature, a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Do you know something in there? Actually, do you know something not in there? You know something not in there? He does not refer to these as gifts whatsoever. He, he didn't start naming gifts as, well, you need the gift of tongues. Man, you need this gift or, or you just can't do it. You can't make it. That's not what he did. That's all he did. He, he, he laid out some things. He said, you know, Christ came. He gave us some apostles and then there's some prophets. And hey, now, what do we got now? Pastors and teachers. And what are we called to do? Study the Word of God. And he didn't call it a gift at all. He didn't call it a gift at all. Now, some may be more talented in their ability to teach and things like that. He didn't call it a gift. That is not, he did not call that a gift in that passage. He didn't say it was a special anointing. I get so sick of hearing that. Uh, you have to have special law and do that. Said, no, you got to have some gumption and determination and some willpower. You know what God says the greatest thing you can have outside of charity? Faithfulness to the task. Faithful to the task. What does he come? What does he say? He said, if I come, will I find special gifts on the earth? No, he says, will I find faith on this earth? That's the thing that Jesus asked about when he says, when I come, what am I going to find? I hope I find some faithful people. He didn't say any talented people. He didn't say any gifted people. He didn't say any powerful people. He didn't say any rich people. He didn't say any poor people. He said, I just want some faithful people. I'll tell you something, you be faithful, God will use you. God will do great and mighty things to you. He's looking for people with a heart of faithfulness. He's, that's what he's looking for. Listen to what he says. He goes on. He said, I was a child, I spake as a child, I was as a child, I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. When I have grown up, when I have grown up, I put away some of these things. Now notice, notice what else he says. He says, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. Now, he stated, it's all the same context. What is he saying? This was a reference to the cloudy, dark glass that they had. You couldn't see through it well. You could barely see through it all. You could see a little, you could see a figure go by, but you couldn't see it all together. You, you couldn't make it out real well. It's also referring to the polished brass that they would use to, to they take a piece of brass or that piece of cloudy glass and they try to see their own image in it. And it was you'd polish it up as best, but you're not gonna see your whole face, it's definitely not gonna be clear. What is he saying about these things? He's saying these prophecies, this gift of prophecy, this gift of knowledge, gift of tongues. It's not a clear vision. It's not clear at all. But when that which is finished is come, that which is brought to its completed state is come, we will see clearly then. We will see clearly. What does the Word of God do, friend? What does it do? It reveals us for who we are. We see ourselves. Say, John, I need to see myself clearly. Don't look in the mirror at home. Look in the Word of God. And it will reveal your heart. It will reveal your heart, your mind, and your soul. It cuts deep, friend. It reveals everything about us. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, The Word of God, the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing, even dividing the sun of soul and spirit. The joints in the marrow, that's our flesh, that's our soul, that's our spirit. It's a discerner of our thoughts and intents of the heart. It reveals every aspect about you, friend. It reveals every aspect about you. There's nothing hid when you grab this book and you read it and let the Holy Spirit start 
slicing away things that need to be removed. And he goes on, he says, and now abides faith, hope, and charity. These three. The greatest of these is charity. The greatest of these is charity. What is the greatest eternal gift? Why well, I say eternal? Charity never faileth. Remember that? Very beginning. Charity never faileth. These things will fail. These things will cease. Hey, charity never will. The doing things out of a sacrificial love, that will never, ever, ever go away. Charity never fails. Charity is eternal in its endurance. Charity is eternal in its endurance. It was revealed to us as an in, in eternal plan from God. That's what salvation is. It was revealed to you and I as an eternal plan from God. In eternity past, God said, I will create and I will save those that will call on me. And I will be with them eternally. He sacrificed out of a heart of love eternity past to eternity future. That is what charity is. It's eternal in its endurance. One day we'll be walking the streets of gold, skinning the, 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 uh, the highlights, the high lines, the mansions on that new earth. We'll be breathing in that wonderfully pure, perfect air. We'll be singing praises of God and we'll be thinking about how long can this endure and God will speak to us say forever. It's eternal in its endurance. That's how much He loves us. Charity is eternally deep. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation? No. Not strong enough. Not powerful enough. Distress? Persecution? Or fear? Or nakedness? Or peril? Or sword? Is that depth? Or height? None of this can separate us from the love of God. Charity is eternally deep in its scope. Charity is eternally powerful. He said, I persuade neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing stronger than God's love for you and me. Praise God, because Satan sure hates us a whole lot. He hates us so much he can't stand the sight of us. He hates when we come together and we worship. He hates when we rely upon God. He hates when we say, well, God has given us enough. He says, no! I want to get them to love something else. I want to get them to love anything but God because... He hates us, but listen, God's love is stronger. God's love is more powerful than anything Satan could throw at us. God's love, charity, is eternally rewarding. It's eternally rewarding. As we enter into the time of Christ's judgment seat, Jesus will reward those that have been faithful to Him with crowns of glory, crowns of life, crowns of redemption, blessings, privileges, all of these things because of the great grace of God, because Jesus sacrificed Himself out of love for you and for me. Oh, the love of Christ, the love of God, the greatness of God's gift towards man, which we'll be celebrating next Sunday. Amen? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 says this, and we close. Is that or not? And we close. Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2. This is what God's direction to you and me is. He says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. As dear children. Isn't that good? That's what you say to your child you love. Dear child, listen. Walk in love. He didn't say walk in power. He didn't say walk in, in gifts. He didn't say walk in special abilities. He said you just walk in love. You just walk in love as Christ hath loved us and hath given Himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Listen today, friend, as we close up that chapter 13, Jesus is saying to you and I through His inspired Word, He is saying, friend, the greatest thing you can do is walk like Christ walked. Jesus, how do I walk like you walk? You sacrifice yourself out of love for those around you. And let me tell you something. There, there are, are men and women in this church, man, they get it. They sacrifice, they love, they, 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 they help others around. I see it every week when I go out in this community. I see people from Bethel sacrificing for others. 
And I go, man, they get it. They love like Christ loved. And that's what it's about. That's the greatest thing we can do. That's the highest of heights in the Christian faith. Listen. Say, so maybe, maybe you're here today and go, John, I really hadn't sacrificed for others this year. It's never too late to start, amen? In fact, this is the best time to start. Best time to start. Why? Because we're celebrating the gift of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're celebrating the gift of Jesus Christ. Once you give, once you give. Hey, listen, we, I didn't plan this. It didn't even cross my mind. We're about to give to help a missionary, amen? We're about to give to give. See how God works this stuff out? Y'all know I, I ain't smart enough to do this stuff. But we're going to give and help a missionary out. We're going to help him continue on giving the gift of truth to a people so inundated with lies. And listen, as we're in this world, we need to keep giving people truth and love who are inundated with the lies of this world. Friend, that's what we try to do, isn't it? That's what we try to do every week, every Wednesday, every Sunday, every day we go out, we want to tell people the truth of God. Don't hide the truth from them. Share it with them. Show them you love. Show them you care. Let's all stand as we have a hymn of invitation. Hymn of invitation. After the invitation, we're going to let the ladies go and our youth.